the topic that we are going to cover is the learning mechanisms in RBF. This is a topic which uh, we have already introduced in the last uh, class and in fact uh, this is the last uh, topic that we wish to cover under the chapter of the radial basis functions. Now, one thing which uh, you have noted uh, during our last uh, lecture is that uh, whereas in the case of uh, the multilayered perceptrons or single layer perceptrons, uh, as the free parameters what we have is the set of all the WGIs, right, where the weights are the free parameters, I mean weights and the bias of course, okay. And then we have to adjust these weights and the bias in order to, um, I mean, um, uh, satisfy the constraints of the problem which is given to us through the form of uh, the uh, training patterns, okay. Whereas in the case of the RBF, what we have as the free parameters is not only the set of WIs which are the uh, um, uh, synaptic weights from the hidden layer outputs, I mean from the hidden layer to the output layer, okay. But also the centers of the uh, radial basis functions, okay, which we call as the TIs, those TIs also will be regarded as the set of these TIs will be also regarded as a free parameter to the system, okay. Now that means to say that in accordance with the training patterns, okay, we have to first adjust these centers of the radial basis functions and when and once that is adjusted <coughs> as a second step to it, this WIs will be adjusted. So it is not that everything can be done together because the adjustments or updatings of the WI inevitably requires that at first all the TIs have been obtained, okay. So this is a two step learning process, okay. Uh, first for the uh, centers of the uh, radial basis functions and then for the synaptic weight connections, okay. Now the first uh, case that we had taken for the choice of the centers was where we chose fixed centers, okay. In fact, when we are choosing fixed centers which are randomly located, okay, there is no learning mechanism that is involved in it. Only thing that we are good is that yes, its performance can be in doubt in some cases where we have got, uh, I mean, dense uh, um, uh, population of uh, training patterns in one of the regions and we have sparse population of uh, training patterns in another region. And then if we uniformly space the uh, centers of the uh, radial basis functions, then its performance will not be good. In fact, uh, here because there is no learning that is involved in the TIs and the only learning that we are making is through this adjustment of the WIs, that is why one requires a very large number of training patterns, okay, in order to achieve a uh, satisfactory level of performance in the radial basis function networks. So that is why one has to see for a better way whereby even the learning mechanism should include the uh, proper choice of these TIs. So the second methodology of the selection of the centers of the radial basis function is what is known as the self-organized selection of centers. Okay. Now, uh, in this case, two uh, stages are involved. First is what is called as the self-organized learning, okay. And in the case of this, I mean this will be the first trip where we estimate the locations of the centers of the RBF.
and then the second step is the supervised learning stage. And this will be used for estimating the linear weights of the output layer. So, we will be, I mean, uh, we know that how the supervised learning stage in the second one uh, is carried out because that is our very standard LMS algorithm, okay, which will be used for the second one. But what is important uh, for us to know is the mechanism of the self-organized learning, okay, that is to estimate the locations of the center. And this, in fact, is done by the k means clustering algorithm so for this mechanism to work what we have to do is to uh, uh, feed a set of training patterns okay and then in accordance with the training patterns we have to properly adjust the positions of these ti's all right now uh, here, I mean, intuitively we can first talk about the approach that uh, what is it that we are looking for. Now, supposing we are having, we have selected that there are m1 number of such centers of the RBF. I mean, we have chosen m1 number of RBFs in the hidden layer. So, we have got T1, T2 up to Tm1, okay as the centers. Let us say that initially we randomly distribute those centers. In fact, initially we do not have any proper mechanism okay, to uh, direct that where exactly are we going to place our uh, centers initially. So, let us say that it is random to start with and then we will be feeding the training patterns one by one. Okay. Let us say that we feed the first training pattern say x1 as a vector we are feeding x1 and now uh, when the x1 is fed then all these centers of the rbfs okay they will be competing with each other okay to see that if they are closest to the uh, pattern x1 that we have fed that means to say that when x1 is fed then out of the m1 number of ti centers that we have got okay there will be one okay, which will be closest to it okay, and there will be m1 minus 1 others okay, who will be I mean relatively at a distant away from it. Okay. Although it, it does not uh, necessarily say that there is no question of having a tie. Okay. There can still be tie in some cases where maybe that more than one centers okay, will be having the same distance and if that is the case in that case any one can be arbitrarily declared as the winner because there it would not really matter that whether we declare uh, I mean out of the competing whether we declare this as the winner or uh, some other uh, center as the winner, but one of the centers will be the winner based on the proximity to the training input that you have fed. All right. Now, uh, what we have to do is that the center which emerges as the winner, what we do is that we move that center okay, closer to the pattern. Okay. We do not exactly make it equal to the position of the input, we just make it closer. Why? Because I mean uh, it is not that a particular center okay, will respond to only one pattern. I mean the uh, center is not re really patented to one particular pattern only, that center may be responding to a group of patterns. So, ultimately what happens is that if those group of patterns are organized in some manner, okay, then possibly the centroidal position of that group, okay, I mean the center will try to lie there. So, what we do essentially is that once the first pattern let us say x 1 is fed, we will be moving the 
uh, center, uh, I mean, which emerges as the winner in the competition, we will be moving that center closer to the uh, position of the pattern. Okay. And that we do by a simple mechanism of learning. I mean, like, just like the way we did for the earlier case, that means to say that we choose a particular learning rate and then in accordance with the learning rate, we will move it closer. Next, we feed x2 and for x2, there may be some other center that emerges as the winner. So, we move that. In fact, it is only the position of the winner that is changed. All the losers, I mean the centers which are losers in the competition, they remain in their same position. We do not update their positions. Okay. So, it is a kind of a winner takes all type of an algorithm okay, where the winning um, uh, centers position will be updated and then accordingly in the next iteration, I mean, I mean when we feed the training pattern for the next epoch, okay, then there is a better chance of finding that uh, neuron which emerged as the winner in the earlier uh, epoch. Okay. The chances are that this time it will be uh, even closer to the um, uh, pattern that we have fed and then it will be move even further closer. And in fact, there will be a stage okay, when the positions will not change much from iteration to iteration and from epoch to epoch if the positions more or less remain the same. That means to say that it has achieved some kind of a stability. So, all the centers that we have chosen have already moved to the centers of the patterns okay, which emerge as the cluster. So, we will be having I mean several such clusters. I mean each one cluster will correspond to one of the centers. Okay. So, that is why this is uh, to be done using what is called as the k-means clustering algorithm. So, having understood the philosophy of it, okay, I think we can uh, I mean present the algorithm okay, which uh, should not be difficult for you to understand. So, the self-organized learning mechanism that we are talking of okay, will be consisting of four basic steps. Okay. The first step so, in the k means clustering, which uh, will do the self organized learning of uh, the uh, selection of such centers, the first step is the initialization. So, in this process, we choose random values of initial centers. So, we choose uh, T k okay, where we choose k as a variable okay, I mean as the index and uh, because it is the initial estimate. So, that is why we are putting here within the parenthesis 0. So, here the number that we write down under the parenthesis is that is the iteration number. So, uh, the iteration number 0 means it is initial. So, we choose some random position. So, then accordingly later on this t k s will be updated as t k 1, t k 2 like that. So, the nth iteration will be uh, I mean we will be calling that as t k n. Okay. So, this uh, can be chosen as a random value, but only restriction is that the initial values should be different. Should be different. So, it should not be that uh, in the random positioning of the initial uh, centers, okay, we happen to place two or I mean more than one centers in the same position. That is the only restriction that we impose that that is not allowed. Okay. The second uh, step that is involved in the k means clustering is a process of sampling and sampling will mean that uh, to draw a sample vector from the input space. So, here what we do is that we draw a sample vector, okay, let us say that is the x vector okay, from the input space H.
okay. Now, uh, this I mean supposing we are in the nth iteration, okay. So, for iteration n, the sample that we have drawn, we can write it as x of n, okay. Given that in the nth iteration, we have picked up the sample vector x. Okay, I mean we will be picking, I mean picking the sample vector for every iteration, right? From the input space. Okay. Now next, the third step will be what? I think you can guess that the third step will be a computation of distance. Yes, a computation of distance or a computation of similarity in the distance. Okay, so. The competition of the distance or in other words we can call this as the similarity matching. Okay. Now, in, in uh, this case what we do is that we have to determine that which is the index of the winning center. Okay. So, supposing we denote that k as a function of x. Why as a function of x? Because I mean the index that is there for the winning uh, RBA position okay, is definitely a function of x that is the input because if we feed a different input, we can get a different center. So, the index will be different. So, the index should always be written as a function of the input that we are feeding, function of the input vector that we are feeding. So, we choose that let k x denote the index of the winning center, denote the index of the best matching that is to say the winning center of input vector x. Okay. Now, here we can write that this k x, k x will be mathematically expressed as what? k x will be the argument of the minimum value, minimum over k of what the Euclidean distance between x at iteration n and its difference with t k at iteration n and this minimum we have to find out over k. That means to say that for all the competing centers, okay, given a pattern x at the iteration n, we have to find its distance with all the competing centers okay, whose uh, index is k. So, it is the minimum over that k that we find out. So, this in effect will give us the minimum distance, but we are not interested in the minimum distance value as such. We are interested in finding out the index of the uh, RBF okay, which has got the minimum, I mean which is closest to this extent. So, we take the argument of this minimum function. So, that will give us the index of the winning uh, uh, center. Okay, for the pattern x. Okay. So, this actually this k, the value of k in our case can be varying from 1 to m 1, because we have assumed that there are m 1 number of such different centers that we have chosen. Okay. Now, uh, what will be the fourth step? We have to move the, yes, updating. The fourth step is obviously updating where we have to move the winning center okay, closer to the pattern. So, how we do that? Okay. The center of the RBF is adjusted according to the updating rule, because we have already got t k n okay, and supposing k is the index of the best matching neuron. So, uh, I mean best matching uh, center. So, what we have to do is that we have to have t k n plus 1 n plus 1 is the updated center position. Okay. T k n is the present center position and T k n plus 1 is going to be the updated center position okay. and 
where will T k n plus 1 be? T k n plus 1 will be equal to T k n okay, that is to say the present position plus we have some learning rate let us say eta again okay, and x n minus T k n. Okay. So, obviously, depending upon the distance between these two that is x n minus T k n, we will be giving the vector a push. That means to say the whole idea will be to move it closer to the uh, pattern x of n. Okay. So, this updating we will be doing only if k is equal to k x, k x is assumed to be the winning position right k x is the winning position. So, if the k th center that we have chosen to update happens to be the winning center itself, then we will be applying this updating rule. And if that is not the case, what are we going to do? I have told you that. What will be t k n plus 1? Yes, remain the same. Remain the same. So, that means to say that in that case t k n plus 1 will be t k n. Okay. So, this is the case otherwise. Okay. And obviously, as before, what we have to do is to choose some learning rate eta, okay, which lies between 0 and 1. Okay. So, this is the fourth step, which is the updating, but mind you, updating we have done okay, for uh, only one uh, this thing, I mean for only uh, one pattern. Now, similarly, we have to do it for all the patterns and then once that is done for all the patterns, okay, we have to repeat it all over again. Okay. And so, what we have to do is that the next step will be the continuation. So, as a continuation step, what we have to do is to increment n by 1. So, in fact, by implementing n by 1, what we are actually doing is that yes, we are going over to the next iteration and in next iteration, we are drawing a different sample. So, I mean this n is not an index by epoch, but rather n is an index, I mean n we update and for every iteration, we pick, the, uh, pick a new vector. So, it is not like that, uh, I, I, I mean like the way the learning mechanism is there for the multilayered perceptron, where we said that okay, you have to finish off x 1 to x n okay, and that constitutes an epoch and then again you have to present x 1 to x n. Here it says that okay, you pick up the iteration number n, pick any pattern from the input space, update n, make it n plus 1 and then again pick up something at random. So, if you are doing it randomly okay, several times, then there will be a stage when every pattern will be picked up sometime or the other and then the learning will be carried out. So, the, the so what we do as a continuation step is to increment n by 1 okay, and then where we have to go? We have to go back to the step number 2 that is the sampling. After updating n, we have to draw a fresh sample from the input space. So, increment n by 1, then go back to step 2. Okay. And we have to continue until no noticeable change changes are observed in the centers, until no noticeable change changes are observed in the centers T k. Okay. So, this algorithm I mean looks pretty imp impressive. So, that means to say that uh, the first step of learning will be the adjustments of all these ti's okay. and once that is done, then only we will be in a position to go in for the second step of adjusting the weights. Okay. Now, in fact, uh, 
if you look at the k-means clustering algorithm, I think you have uh, already started feeling that it is a competitive learning process. I mean, we have already uh, discussed something about the competitive learning uh, mechanism. I mean, when we were talking uh, uh, as the generalized learning mechanisms, I mean, towards the beginning of this uh, course, okay, that in, uh, uh, so this is a case of competitive learning and in fact, in this case, what is happening is that the centers are getting organized and they are getting organized themselves without the involvement of any supervisor or a teacher, they are adjusting themselves just by the process of feeding the patterns. So, that is why since they are organizing themselves on their own without a teacher, we are calling that this is a form of self-organization. Okay. And this self-organization is a mechanism okay, which is a form of the competitive learning network and those networks are called as the self-organizing maps or SOMs okay. and we will be covering the self-organizing maps okay, because it is a very important and quite interesting self, uh, I mean competitive learning mechanism. So, we will be covering the self-organizing maps okay, in our uh, future lectures. Okay. Uh, but uh, I mean one thing that uh, one uh, has to say is that I mean let us not think that the scheme means clustering algorithm is free from its drawbacks. Because one thing what uh, we have said is that the very first step is, a, is an initialization and because we do not know any a priori idea about where the centers should be located, okay, we chose random values. Now, that is the most logical thing that we could do initially, but this has got one drawback that if by chance our initial choice of centers is poor, okay, it could be that the uh, patterns will get uh, stuck, I mean the, the positions okay, uh, of the uh, radial basis function centers will get stuck to the local optimum solution. Okay. And if that is the case, then we will not be having uh, the proper learning of the centers because instead of uh, pointing to a globally optimum, okay, because ideally what it should do is that uh, for the group of patterns which a radial basis function should represent, okay, the, its position should be at the centroid of that. So, if instead it just uh, locally adjusts to a few of the patterns and it does not consider the others which it should have, okay, then that is not a proper learning. So, this obviously has got some drawback, okay, uh, I mean in the process of its self-organization. So, that is why it was uh, felt that maybe that uh, can we incorporate any supervised learning mechanism in this movement of the centers. Because here the only supervised learning process that is involved in this sort of a self-organization of the uh, centers of the RBF is if we, um, uh, I mean is, is in the second step. In the second step there is a supervision that can be incorporated because there we can compute the error okay, between the desired and the actual response and then accordingly we can adjust the WIs accordingly. But uh, I mean not for the adjustment of the centers because they are organized in a self-learning manner. So, we now come to a third methodology where we will be talking about a supervised selection of centers. Okay, so, this is the third mechanism, third alternative process to learning which is supervised selection of centers. So, in this case what, what is going to happen is that it is not only the WIs, but also the TIs which will go through a supervised learning process. Okay. So, naturally for a supervised learning process, we know that the most obvious choice is the error correcting learning, okay, what we have already studied. Okay. So, if we can introduce 
a form of error correcting learning which is most conveniently used implemented using a gradient descent algorithm. Okay. In that case we can uh, I mean achieve the supervised uh, way of uh, learning for the uh, centers T i s also. Okay. So, in order to have that we will be talking in terms of the cost function. So, we can define the instantaneous value of the cost function as So, in this case actually in the third alternative that is supervised selection of uh, centers, okay, we choose that uh, I mean the learning mechanism will be now actually epoch wise, epoch wise in the sense that uh, we will be um, f first feeding the set of n patterns okay, and then we will be I mean we will be keeping the weights same for all the n patterns. I mean like the batch learning mechanism, weights, the centers, everything will be kept the same. And then depending upon the error that we obtain, okay, we will be making adjustments. So, what we will be having is that, so this will constitute an epoch and for an epoch the cost function that we are considering is, we are calling that as the uh, instantaneous value of the cost function which we are writing as half of E j square okay. and this is j is equal to 1 to n. Okay. So, the sum of all the E j square from 1 to n we are calling as the instantaneous value of the error and in this case the error E j will be simply defined as the desired D j minus the actual response and how do we make the actual response. Now, in this case this is definitely an approximating network that we are taking because we are feeding n number of patterns, but we are having choice of m 1 number of centers where m 1 is less than that of n. So, because this is an approximating function we have to use f star. Okay. So, this is f star of x j all right. So, this is the error Okay. And in fact, we can uh, represent this f star x j as follows. So, we can rewrite this expression as d j minus summation over i is equal to 1 to m 1 okay, of what this can be expressed as w i times g okay, the Green's function of I mean with the argument x of j minus T i and instead of choosing the Euclidean norm as an argument, we choose the uh, weighted norm as an argument to it. So, this is the ith. So, we choose this as C i. So, this is the ith Green's function. So, we choose the uh, weighted norm as the C i matrix. So, we write it as C i. So, this is the uh, weighted norm of this. Uh, function I, I mean weighted norm of this argument. So, this is our instantaneous error. Okay. So, what we have to do in this process is, uh, so this is E j and we will be accordingly finding the E j square and then the instantaneous value of the cost function okay. and what our requirement will be to find all the free parameters. So, our requirement is to find w i s definitely w i s are the free parameters, t i s they are also the free parameters. Anything else that is the free parameter? No, yes there are. You see that uh, we are choosing the weighted norm. So, weighted norm means there is a C i matrix that is involved, that is right, a uh, weighting matrix. So, even the weighting matrix element okay, that is also a free parameter to it. Okay. So, weighting matrix is a free parameter. In other words, I mean uh, what we have as a free parameter is the sigma. Sigma is what? Sigma we had we had chosen as the 
uh, yes, I mean as a covariance matrix of that. So, as a free parameter, we can also have sigma i or rather what we actually require in our case is the sigma i inverse, because actually sigma i inverse, if you uh, remember our last time its expression, okay, that is essentially indicating the spread of the uh, Green's function. Okay. So, even that is also a free parameter. So, it is not only the centers, but also what size are you choosing for the function, that is also made a variable that has a free parameter. So, everything can be controlled okay, or everything can be updated. Okay. So, our requirement is to find the best set of w i t i sigma i inverse, so that the error is minimized. Okay. So, so as to minimize the error e. Okay. So, the result of this minimization okay, we can summarize as, as follows. Okay. In fact, that uh, I mean I am writing the results, okay, but you can do it as an exercise yourself. Okay. You see that the first result that we present is that of the updating of the linear weights. Now, linear weights are the ones that we are having at the output layer. And in order to find the linear weights, what we have to do is to differentiate the error with respect to, with respect to, come on, do not keep quiet with respect to w i's, with respect to w i's, because when our objective is to update the linear weights, we should differentiate the E with respect to w i. Okay. And what are we going to obtain out there? I mean, can anybody make a good guess? You see, look at the expression of E, E is summation of E j square, j is equal to 1 to n. And individually, this E j is like this. All right. So, if you look at the E j's expression here, there is a D j which is of course, independent of W j okay. and only here we are having some terms that is involving W i. Okay. Now, uh, out of all these things up to all these uh, uh, i is equal to 1 to m 1, okay, if we try to differentiate, it will be only the term w j okay, that will have a non-zero component and that we have to find out for all this j is equal to 1 to n. So, in effect, if we differentiate this, okay, we are going to obtain a solution of this form. We are going to obtain it as summation j is equal to 1 to n, okay, e j n all right, and then it will be multiplied by the Green's function and the Green's function will be g as an argument x j minus t i at iteration n okay, having the weighted norm c i. All right. And here the w i n plus 1 that is to say the updated weight, the updated weight will be simply given by w i n that is the past weight okay, minus eta 1 do e do w i n, the simplest gradient descent type of a technique that where it will be learning rate times the derivative that we have obtained and that becomes our updated weight. And this mind you we have to carry out for i is equal to 1 to uh, m 1. We have to do it for all the i's for 1 to m 1. Okay. So, this is the, yes please, any doubts? Derivative, negative, derivative, no, derivative, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, but uh, actually speaking, Okay, whatever do e you get as a sign, okay, uh, I, I mean you will have to reverse that sign over here. So, uh, if it happens that uh, this one 
No, because the weights you do not know, I mean weights could be positive, weights could be negative, but uh, whatever term we get, okay, we have to, I mean move in the opposite, uh, I mean in a direction against the gradient. So, naturally there is a minus that is involved in the learning process. So, this will take care. Okay. So, uh, this is the adjustment of the linear weights, which is pretty simple, I mean not uh, any uh, new knowledge that we had acquired, because this sort of a weight adjustment learning we earlier also did, only difference is that in this case we are having the Green's function coming in, in, in the derivative term, but once found out derivative, okay, I mean it is easy to adjust the weights. And next, uh, I mean what is involved is uh, the positions of the centers, because now that is also done in a supervised manner. So, let us see that how the positions of the centers are organized. So, this positions of the centers will be uh, learned for the hidden layer. Okay. So, in order to uh, have that, okay, now what are we going to do for the, uh, I mean how, how, how are we going to differentiate this function E with respect to now, with respect to T i's, yes that is right. So, dou E n, okay, in fact, I mean last time also we should have written here dou E n, okay, because this is the instantaneous error at the uh, nth iteration. So, here we have to see dou E n dou T i n, we have to differentiate with respect to this. And if we do that, okay, in fact, you can just make a guess from here itself that E j square is involved. So, E j square would necessarily mean that uh, there will be a term that involves this uh, W i square. Okay. So, this in effect is 2 times, uh, 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 in fact, I mean uh, that also tells us one thing that uh, somebody was pointing out to me that uh, whether the derivative of uh, E j with respect to W i becomes uh, negative. Okay. In fact, uh, here mind you that there is a square term that is involved. Okay. So, this plus this square plus this square term and then if you take a derivative of this, there is a half term that is involved over here. So, what you get is E j W i that term. Okay. So, the derivative was a positive term, okay. derivative was neg was a negative. Okay. Uh, and uh, here the derivative that we will be obtaining with respect to T i is, is 2 times W i n okay, summation over j is equal to 1 to n E j of n and this time what we are getting is the derivative of this g function. Okay. So, it is g prime that is what we are writing. So, g prime means the derivative of g okay. and as it is argument we will be having x j minus T i of n okay, having weighted norm C i and then this continues sigma i inverse okay, and then we are having the term x j minus T i of n. All right. And here you see that uh, our T i's, okay, uh, T i n plus 1 becomes equal to T i n minus again some learning rate, but last time the last learning rate that is to say for the uh, linear weights, we were putting eta 1 as the learning rate. So, this time we have to put a different learning rate for the positions of the center. So, we put it as eta 2 as the learning rate. So, this is eta 2 minus dou E n dou T i n. All right. Now, uh, in this case you see that okay, T i n plus 1 becomes the updated positions of the center. Uh, one point that uh, um, uh, you, you should note at this stage is that how are we obtaining T i n plus 1? We have to take the 
derivative with respect to T i of course, derivative of the error and error we are getting only because we know that what our desired pattern is. So, definitely the positions of the centers they are also adjusted in accordance with the supervision because we know that what d i is we know what errors are and because we know what errors are we can compute the derivative of that error function and we can move the center positions accordingly. So, it is a supervised adjustment of the positions of the center and uh, as I was telling you that in addition to the uh, determination of the positions of the centers, okay, even the spreading of the centers okay, that also can be determined in this case. Okay. In which case what we have to do is to differentiate this E's with respect to sigma i's. Okay. So, if we do that then we will be getting results of this nature. So, the third learning that is involved with this supervised selection of clusters is the spreading of centers. This also is to be done in the <coughs> hidden layer. Okay. So, there what we have to do is dou E n dou sigma i inverse at n. Okay which will be equal to minus w i n summation j is equal to 1 to capital N e j of n g prime argument is x j minus t i n with, with norm c i times q j i n. So, q j i n is a new matrix whose definition is like this q j i n is actually the outer product matrix which is obtained using x j minus t i n. So, because it is an outer product what we have to do is x j minus t i n and then have x j minus T i n transpose. So, if you multiply this with the transpose then you will be getting the outer product of x j minus T i n with itself. Okay. So, that is the composition of this q i j n matrix okay, which we will be requiring in the computation of the derivative. Okay. And once this derivative is computed then the sigma the updated sigma matrix okay, could be obtained like this. So, sigma inverse n plus 1 is equal to sigma inverse at iteration n. Okay. This is for the ith center mind you. Okay. So, this is this is done for the ith center and we have to do it for i is equal to 1, 2 up to m 1 for all the m 1 centers we have to do this. So, this is eta i n minus uh, I mean this is for um, uh, sigma i n minus again it should be proportional to the derivative. So, dou e dou sigma i inverse okay, dou e n dou sigma i inverse n okay. and this we have to multiply by its learning rate. So, there is a third learning rate that is coming into picture and that is why we are putting it as eta 3. Okay. So, this way we will be able to adjust the spreading of the centers also. Okay. So, again you can see that three things are getting involved. One is the adjustment of the linear weights, the second is positions of the centers and the third is the spreading of the centers. All right. These three things are involved. So, uh, now you can see that uh, the first one that is to say the linear weight adjustment if you now concentrate on uh, then it can be shown I mean although I mean we are not showing the detailed analysis of this, but it can be shown that 
this uh, uh, error surface okay, happens to be convex with respect to the weights. Okay. So, as a result it is possible for us to obtain a globally minimum solution as far as this linear weights are concerned. Whereas, this uh, surface is not exactly I mean the cost function is not convex or rather I mean it is non-convex with respect to T i's and the sigma i inverse. So, since the cost function is non-convex with respect to T i and sigma i inverse, okay, the optimum values that we get for T i and sigma i inverse okay, can get stuck in the local minimum. Okay. And uh, one thing that you see that here also a supervised learning is involved in the case of uh, this uh, supervised selection of centers. We have a supervised learning, but the supervised learning in this case is much different from that of the back propagation algorithm. Okay, because back propagation you see what happens is we start with the outer layer and then we adjust the inner ones. In this case, there is no such requirement that we have to first do the output and then we have to come to the center, then we have to do the spreading of the centers. These three things are quite independent of each other. Okay. So, the parallelization of learning mechanism is also possible in this case. Okay. So, this is uh, highly interesting and in fact, I mean lot of good researchers are now going on in the field of the radial basis functions because they have really emerged as a, a good alternative to the back propagation learning process. Okay. Uh, in fact, more of such research I think will continue in the future and there are already several applications of the radial basis functions that one finds, especially in the domain of speech processing. Okay. There is good amount of research that is going on. And, uh, in the image processing, yes, I mean uh, we have not uh, found too many applications of RBF yet, but in the coming years I think we are going to use lot of such applications involving the radial basis functions. Uh, and the next topic which we will be covering from the next class is the principal component analysis, which is in fact a very uh, important, very useful and very efficient tool for the dimensionality reduction of the data. In fact, you will be surprised that uh, whereas in the case of the RBFs, we were talking about some dimensionality increase because what we had talked of is that we had to map it into a higher dimensional space so that the separability of the function okay, improves. Okay. Whereas, in the case of the, of the principal component analysis, the whole motivation will be to obtain a data reduction, which we will be doing by simply doing a dimensionality reduction technique and it, it is done in a very optimal way, finds lot of applications in the uh, data compression, be it speech or be it image and video compression applications. Okay. So, we will be talking about that from the next class. So, till then, goodbye.